Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Coming up, the mainstream media accuses pro-choice Aaron O'Toole of having a secret pro-life agenda. Why today's youth find punctuation triggering and Michael Barrett on the latest in the Wee scandal. The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Hello and welcome everyone to another edition of Canada's Most Irreverent Talk Show. This is the Andrew Lawton Show here on True North. Thank you very much for joining me for another edition. It is August 26th, 2020, just a few days after Aaron O'Toole won the Conservative leadership. And if you believe in that idea that the enemy of your enemy is your friend, surely you must be pretty enthralled that uh, many in the left-wing media, the left-wing sectors of the media, are not too happy with Aaron O'Toole being the conservative leader. So if that is in fact a, uh, a thing that you care about as in it makes you more like someone if uh, the people you don't like I don't like them, then you may be in good standing right now. I'm going to talk about uh, later on the we investigation that the Conservatives are doing outside of the committee because Justin Trudeau has shut down Parliament. And as you know, he's also shut down the investigation into himself. But I'm going to be talking about that with MP Michael Barrett later on in the show. But I do want to begin by discussing a few of the media reactions to Aaron O'Toole. Now, we spent uh, most of the show Monday talking about how Aaron O'Toole became the conservative leader, what it's likely to mean. And again, I, I have to point out here, and this is not a, a knock or an endorsement of O'Toole. I, I think it's just a, a matter of fact observation. He, yes, ran as that true blue conservative. You can't deny that. He ran a, as being consistent and authentic. But he's not a radical by any stretch. There's a guy who's always been a consensus builder. That's always been his approach, as far as I've known him, going back to his time in the Stephen Harper cabinet and looking at his previous leadership campaign. And yeah, he's saying right now that you know he doesn't want to bend the knee on things. He's going to stand up for free speech and cancel culture. But we're not talking about a hardline guy. And I think this is important because it's already happening that the media is trying to paint him as being this radical. And in particular, let's look at his first press conference. So he was supposed to be declared the leader on Sunday. It took until the wee hours of Monday morning. Although, as my friend JJ McCullough pointed out, who's on the West Coast, he said, you know, all the Ontarians need to shut up because typically the uh, <laughs> the, the sun rises and sets on East Coast time. So he said it was nice that there was a, a timing that worked out well for people on the West Coast. But what happened is on Monday morning in the wee hours, Aaron O'Toole is the victor. Because of the late hour, apparently he had, uh, you know, wasn't able to get caught up on all his work on Monday in the daytime. So he waited until Tuesday to do his first press conference. And this was his coming out party, his debutante ball to the media. He comes out, gives a little bit of the same type of speech he gave on Sunday night, the importance of uniting the party and the country. He restated that line about how he wants everyone black, white, brown, if they worship on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, indigenous, immigrant, all of those people. He wants everyone to come out and support him and find a place in the conservative party. Not a hardline message, message, not even an ideological message. But then you listen to the questions he's asked. And he is asked in 15 minutes of a press conference, no fewer than four questions that touch on abortion. Four, four questions about, oh, do you feel you owe social conservatives anything? Which again is a fair question, but when you look at the volume of it, four questions that touch on this thing, when Aaron O'Toole is by his own admission repeatedly and recurrently pro-choice, he is not pro-life at all. The only thing he said and did that was pro-life was say, yes, I realize that social conservatives are a part of the party, and I think we need to make sure that everyone has a voice and protect the long-standing conservative tradition of free votes. That was what he said. That was his only position on this, and he was and is unequivocally pro-choice. Why this is relevant is because if someone who is unequivocally and unabashedly pro-choice is getting hit relentlessly with questions about the social conservatism and about the pro-life agenda and all of that, to the same volume, to the same extent that a leader who was pro-life was, 
What was the whole point of all of that rhetoric we heard from the Red Tories that, oh, we can't have a social conservative, you know, that's what sidelines us. No, the media is asking that anyway. Take a listen to this one question. Now, it's translated, obviously, but this is a reporter from Radio Canada yesterday at his press conference asking about, you guessed it, that social conservative agenda based on a a vote he made a few years ago. Question. This morning, once again, you said that you are a pro-choice MP, but in 2016, you voted for Bill C-225 that wanted to give legal rights to the fetus. How can you reconcile that vote with the fact that you say that you are pro-choice? Answer. Uh, That is incorrect. It was a bill on public safety, in fact, and I voted in favor to have debate in committee on that bill because it was on public safety for women. And that is my approach. It's possible to listen to people and to be a pro-choice MP. That is going to be my approach question. But women's rights advocates will tell you that that's the kind of bill that tries to open up cracks to reopen the debate on abortion. How can you reassure people who may think that? Answer. That was a bill on criminal sentencing, actually. And I have a completely clear track record on social issues as an MP. That's not the case for Justin Trudeau, because in 2013, I was the first of only 18 conservatives who voted for a bill for the LGBT community. Mr. Trudeau missed the vote for a fundraising activity for the Ontario Liberal Party. But I have a clear record, but that Mr. Trudeau does not. We'll be trying to uh, work their, their little uh, spin cycle, and they're already starting. I have a track record of always voting in favor of rights, whether it's the rights of women uh, with respect to choice, whether it's the LGBT community. In my first months as an MP, I was the first conservative of 18 to support an LGBT bill. I will always stand and defend the rights of Canadians. Justin Trudeau skipped the vote, a very close vote, to attend a Cash for Access fundraiser with the Liberals in Toronto. So you'll see where his priorities are. My priorities will be on Canadians. Now, I have to speak about this bill for a moment because Aaron O'Toole, and I didn't actually quite like in his answer how he downplayed what he did. At first, he said, oh, you know, he was just the voting to put it to committee so that people could talk about it. Then later, he said, oh, no, 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 it's just a, a criminal sentencing bill. The private member's bill in question, C-225 from uh, MP Kathy Wagenthal, had a, a very specific purpose. And you can see it in the title, Protection of Pregnant Women and Their Preborn Children Act, Cassie and Molly's Law, an act to amend the criminal code, injuring or causing the death of a preborn child well committing an offense. And if you look in the text of the bill, what this would have done is make it a a separate offense if you knowingly harm a preborn or unborn child in the course of committing a crime. You have to know that the woman in question is pregnant, and if that happens, it's an additional offense. And, And that is not carved out in law right now, because under Canadian law, Right now, up until a moment before a child leaves the birth canal, they cease to exist. So that was the point of this. And obviously, a lot of people, as this Red Duke Canada reporter clearly believes, thought that, oh, this is just, you know, a backdoor way to banning abortion, when in actuality, it was covering an aspect of Canadian law that is leaving vulnerable people unprotected and unaccounted for. A heinous crime happens, there is no recognition in law that something has gone wrong, that something has happened. That was the point of this. The bill didn't pass. Okay, moot point right now. Aaron O'Toole voted for this, which I think proves the point that it wasn't a bill that you had to be a pro-life person to see the value in. But even something so adjacent to being pro-life, but not being pro-life will get you hit by the media for being this, you know, evil, scary, social conservative. And when, because Aaron O'Toole, who is pro-choice, and he said it again, he said it repeatedly, because he's getting hit by this, 
it actually reinforces what has always been my position on this, that there is no better answer to these questions than the truth, because indeed there is no correct answer at all. The media is not actually interested in having a dialogue about this. The media just wants to string everyone up. And as I said on Twitter yesterday, if you so much as like stop to tie your shoe in front of a Catholic church over the last 30 years, you're going to be hit with having an evil, scary, social conservative agenda. So yeah, I wish O'Toole had stood up for Kathy Wagenthal's bill more forcefully than he did instead of downplaying it, because it's pretty easy to figure out just from reading the title and the text what this bill was actually about. But nevertheless, it, it proves that even having a pro-choice leader doesn't make all of these concerns go away. Now, this is not to say that Aaron O'Toole's position is a calculated one. I believe that it's just authentic. That's what he believes. But it's more of a caution to other people in the conservative movement that I mean, this is not rocket science, or shouldn't be, that even if you give the media and the left everything they say they want, it's not going to make the criticisms go away. And on that note, I have to turn, not that I go to Canada's imitation of The View called The Social to get my in-depth political commentary or punditry fix. However, I have to play this clip. It was actually uh, shown to me by one of my colleagues. Believe it or not, part of my working from home routine is not, uh, you know, flipping on the daytime talk shows. But uh, this was a clip from The Social in which the uh, four, I don't know if they're co-hosts or co-anchors or uh, socialites, whatever the term is, are uh, sitting around. They're talking about the conservative leadership race. And there seems to be this overwhelming sense of sadness that Peter McKay didn't win the conservative leadership, which, okay, people who supported McKay, I get why they'd be sad they didn't win. You're always sad when your person isn't elected. But the rationale I have to jump on from one particular uh, member of this panel, and that is Lainey Liu, who, well, why don't you just listen for yourself? I have to say, I I can't, I'm, I have been discouraged by... Prime Minister Justin Trudeau uh, in many ways lately, quite disappointed actually. So when the news came out, or at least in the months preceding this leadership race, that Peter McKay was the front runner, I thought that I would have to make an interesting decision, that I maybe would be able to consider hmm. an alternative to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. And in many ways, I was looking forward to it. And I was prepared to go in thinking differently about the Conservative Party. Mm -hmm. Now, though, with this decision, and as you mentioned, Jess, and the tweet from Fluffy Teal about social conservatism, it feels like this party is turning away from more progressive politics and entrenching itself even, even further in social conservatism. And it makes someone like me, a Canadian voter, who may be open to another option other than Justin Trudeau. And I have voted liberal in the past many times consistently. It makes me wonder, were you thinking about me, Conservative Party of Canada? Like, yeah. didn't you just, did you I'm just not sure, lose I'm me? not sure I agree, Lainey. <laughs> Okay, so listen, here is my position on this. Yes, the conservative base needs to grow. The conservative family needs to grow. People need to bring in other people. But her issue, well, let me clarify. You can tell how terrifying it is for a downtown Toronto media personality to even entertain voting conservative. And, and she says as much, she's like, well, you know, to think that I maybe could have considered thinking about at one point talking about thinking about uh, maybe casting a ballot that was almost for the like there she's trying to like talk herself into or maybe talk herself out of what she's trying to say which is that you know she doesn't necessarily want to vote liberal but it's like it's so painful for her to admit that which I think is in and of itself interesting but the more telling part is when she says the conservatives are moving further and further away from progressive politics, and then I'm a liberal voter, she says, were you thinking of me? No! No, why should the conservatives be thinking of diehard, lifelong liberals when they're deciding who should be the standard bearer of the conservative party? No, of course they weren't thinking of you. 
It's a conservative leadership race. Yes, they want your vote, of course. And yes, you have to reach across the aisle. But when you are deciding who is the conservative standard bearer, the one that gets to, in many cases, sell and champion conservatism, the goal is not to find the candidate that's going to be championing what you call progressive politics. And if this proves what Aaron O'Toole was saying in the leadership race. This proves why Aaron O'Toole won, because progressive voters liked Peter McKay, not because they thought that Peter McKay was a conservative that they could get behind, but because they thought he was a progressive. That's the whole point. They liked him because they thought he was going to give them progressive politics, not conservative politics. A conservative leader does not, in my view, broaden the base by diluting conservatism. They broaden the base by selling conservatism. And that is a very important distinction that is lost in all of the people that said that Peter McKay would be the quote unquote most electable. So that's the whole point here. And, and yes, Aaron O'Toole, to be fair, in his opening remarks at that press conference said, if you're a lifelong liberal NDP voter, I want you to join the family. But he has to bring those people in by showing them how conservatism works. And the way you do that is actually, I would argue, a page out of Derek Sloan's book, which is you are a conservative without apology. You tell people why these values are right for them. Because if you are, and this is true of any ideology, I'm speaking of it now in a conservative context because that's where we are. If you are a conservative and you believe in conservatism, you believe that for a reason. You believe it because it's correct. So the way you get people on board with that is by showing them the same things that drew you to that way of viewing the world. And that clip from The Social, again, I, I don't share it because it's you know high-minded, intellectual, a debate, nor is it supposed to be. That's not a, a knock at the host. I'm saying it's not a politics show. It's a, a chit chat news, uh, not even really a news show. It's a chit chat show. But when, when that clip comes across my radar, I look at it and I'm like, that is exactly the point. And that's why Aaron O'Toole got to the place that he did. Because the only people that were really enthusiastic about McKay were not, in fact, conservatives. He was the favorite of the media. He was the favorite, in many respects, of the left. And people who, again, were thinking, uh, well, you know, I, I like conservative. Because here's, here's the problem. And this is what Ms. Liu wants. She wants an alternative liberal party. She doesn't want an alternative to liberalism. She wants an alternative to Justin Trudeau and to the Liberal Party of Canada. And this is, again, an aspect of this dialogue that a lot of people, I don't think, realize. They just want someone else to champion the same policies that Justin Trudeau and the Liberals are championing, but without the baggage of Justin Trudeau. And it's why, by the way, the Liberals would be very smart were they to replace Justin Trudeau with a Christian Freeland or some other leader, because what the Liberals have right now is a branding problem in that the shine has come off Justin Trudeau. No, not the shoe polish, the shine has come off. Well, I mean, maybe the shoe polish has come off too, but this has all come off Justin Trudeau and they're just left with this not as advertised guy filled with baggage, filled with scandal, filled with a, a pretty abysmal record in the last year or so in, in particular, and that's where they have nowhere left to go. And if you had a, an NDP that was a little bit more on the ball, that might be a, a big threat to the Liberals. And yeah, you could have a Conservative that picks up some of that support by being a Justin Trudeau alternative. But as I said on Monday, at that point, the Conservative Party ceases to be a Conservative Party. So there is a lesson in this. The people that were enthusiastic about McKay and excited about McKay only wanted someone who was, and again, I'm, I'm hinging a lot on one person's words, but I, I think she encapsulates a lot of the people that we've seen online and heard from in the last several months about this. They want somebody who's going to champion progressive politics who simply isn't Justin Trudeau. And when you allow your message to not just be diluted, but in many cases reversed, you haven't actually won anything. And that is where it's important to stick to your guns and stick to your principles. 
We've got to take a break. When we come back, more of The Andrew Lawton Show. Hang tight. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Speaking of high-minded political commentary, I had a couple of emails ahead of today's show asking me to uh, to tell this story. There's not really much of a story. I got into like a one-sided fight with Jan Arden on Twitter, which is a point, I guess, at which I have already lost just by virtue of engaging in it. But uh, Jan Arden, who, again, I, I knew of her music, I think, uh, 10 to 15 years ago when uh, that was, I suppose, the last time anyone knew of Jan Arden's music. And I, I liked some of her songs, actually. You know, easy listening, adult contemporary. She does that uh, one Buble song, and, the, and Buble did it. I thought he did it better, but uh, I digress. Uh, so Jan Arden is not a fan of Aaron O'Toole. So she had tweeted out, uh, you know, again, high-minded political commentary here on August 24th. Aaron is a tool. And I'm like, okay, it's a joke. It's not a good joke, but I can respond with a joke that's not all that good. And I had said on Twitter, fun fact, Jan Arden has had the same number of hits in the last 10 years as Aaron O'Toole, which is to say none, because all good jokes are rooted in the truth. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it didn't r really work out too well for me. Uh, if you can uh, look, uh, you know, an hour later, uh, that was the tweet that I got back, or that was the image I saw on Twitter. Jan Arden has blocked you. So again, I don't know what I'm missing out on, probably nothing, but uh, there we go. So. Dish it out and not taking it. That is one of the great sins of comedy. This is a uh, bizarre story. You'd think it was comedy. And I actually learned of this from uh, William McBeath, who uh, many uh, people involved in, in Canadian politics would no doubt know. He's a, a spokesperson for Save Calgary. And William McBeath had tweeted something that I, I didn't actually believe. And it was that, uh, <laughs> again, this is, I can't stress enough that I thought this was a joke. That, Australia once went to war against birds and lost. And this actually had me looking into a bit of Australian history, and I discovered the Great Emu War. Is it Emu or Emu? I think it's Emu. The Great Emu War of uh, 1932, in which uh, the Australian military was deployed to fight rampant overpopulation of emus. They were uh, taking the large flightless birds to task. They were armed with guns. They were shooting the emus. They killed a number of them. And still, for some reason, the emus emerged victorious. So if uh, Canada ever ends up in conflict with Australia, I have a high high-minded likelihood that uh, we will emerge. <laughs> we will not uh, be destroyed if, if Australia couldn't handle a, a few birds. So uh, I thought this story was actually for the birds. No, nothing? Okay, I need a laugh track. All right, in any case, that was actually a true story. You can read up on the Great Emu War. Uh, thank you, William McBeath, I guess, for uh, telling me that was a thing. Although, uh, to any respect I had lingering for the people of Australia, I feel is gone. Also in random news here, this comes from the London Evening Standard. Young people are intimidated by full stops. So, you know, periods at the end of sentences because they see them as a sign of anger. Linguists say this story has found that people in Generation Z find that a full stop seems deliberate because in text messages, most people don't use punctuation, apparently. It bothers me greatly. So that if you put a period, it means that uh, they are trying to be mad at you. So if you send a text message without a full stop, uh, Dr. Lauren Fontaine tweets, then it's obvious that you've concluded the message. So if you add an additional marker for completion, they will read something into it, and it tends to be a falling intonation or negative tone. So the rationale is that hitting send on a message is good enough to say it's complete. You don't need to put a period. So I'm actually weird because I will put like a period after the word uh, hi or hey, just because that's how I was raised. You have to use uh, periods or, or full stops. I've never really called them full stops, but that's what they are. You have to use a full stops at the end of a sentence for it to be proper. Now, maybe I'll just do an exclamation mark because then I'm, I'm finishing it with a punctuation mark that is appropriate. But then I'm like, are the youth today, I sound so old, but are the youth today so triggered that punctuation is now seen as this great affront against their delicate sensibilities. Apparently, the answer to that is yes. One linguist at Cambridge, Owen McArdle, had said, oh, he's not sure about emails. You know, I guess it depends how formal they are. But he says, full stops are the exception and not the norm and now have a role in signifying an abrupt or angry tone 
of voice. So uh, all of the media that thinks Aaron O'Toole is too angry, maybe he's just been using too many full stops in his uh, campaign emails. Perhaps that's the case. And also in political correctness news, Rule Britannia, one of the great uh, anthems of the era and of the West, is now being cancelled. BBC removes the lyrics to Rule Britannia because apparently it is just this great, uh, terrible ode to colonialism. So BBC is having its legendary last night of the proms and is now just doing an instrumental version of Rule Britannia uh, because it is uh, going to just offend people too much to celebrate uh, the colonial glory of Great Britain. So uh, Nigel Farage, of course, didn't take too kindly to this. Here's a video he posted of him just belting it out louder than I think the uh, last night of the proms orchestral choir ever could have. Now, thankfully, Boris Johnson, the prime minister of Britain, who's never been one to kowtow to political correctness, actually went against, it sounds like, his own staff when he spoke out about this. He said uh, in one interview, they're trying to restrain me from saying this, but I wanted to get it off my chest. So I'm assuming that they refers to the handlers that are being like, oh, no, you, you mustn't. You mustn't talk about this. No, no, no. You should let them let it go. No, you mustn't. And then he's like, ah, you know, forget about it. I'm going to do it. Uh, but, uh, but now, again, when you have like uh, something that is almost a national anthem, it's not quite, I know God Save the Queen or uh, God Save the King at some points is the British national anthem. Rule Britannia is pretty much the next best thing. So when now you're going after that, and not even for any real reason, I can't find anyone sensible who's actually raised a concern about this, you have gone too far. We have to take a break. When we come back, we will speak to Conservative MP Michael Barrett, the latest in the WE investigation, which, even if the Liberals don't want it to go on, is still existing in some form. We'll talk about that up next here on The Andrew Lawton Show. Stay tuned. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Welcome back. Well, as you saw and heard last week, Pierre Polyev and Michael Barrett last week were uh, raising the issues of the redacted WE documents and talking about all of the things that they were finding in them, although a lot of the things that they couldn't find because the Liberals decided to take the old black highlighter to these things before handing them over. And, and when Justin Trudeau prorogued Parliament, of course, it ended up putting a stop to all of the committee work, including the committee in investigating the WE scandal, the scandal in which Justin Trudeau was uh, handing out giant, massive contracts to people that have been paying his family members and bringing Bill Morneau on vacations and cozying up with liberal staff and all of these other things. And the fact is that without the parliamentary oversight of this, a lot of people are questioning what can still be done. So I want to talk about this with Michael Barrett. He joins me on the line now. He's a Conservative Member of Parliament from Ontario and also the Conservative Ethics Critic. Michael, good to talk to you. Thanks very much for coming on today. Thanks for having me here, Andrew. Ethics Critic, that's pretty much a full-time job with this government, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And it's no uh, surprise that the Ethics Commissioner's Office um, has had uh, job postings uh, in in the summer of scandal 2020 with uh, with all that's going on. So we hear often from Justin Trudeau that he works closely with the uh, ethics commissioner, and uh, I think that they should probably just get someone uh, on retainer or or maybe put a direct door between the two offices they have to visit so often. So yeah, for for my part, it's uh, it's busy. We saw the press conference last week with you and, and your colleague in the Conservative Caucus, Pierre Polyev, going through a number of those uh, release documents from WE, a great many of them redacted. And, and the Liberals have tried to use the release of those documents in, in some way to defend against shutting down the committee investigation. I was hoping you could set the record straight here. What work can actually continue over the course of the summer with Parliament prorogued? Well, uh, I'll first note that on those documents that uh, the prime minister and other liberals have trumpeted as this great measure of transparency, 
um, the the documents came redacted, and so uh, which is which is contrary to the committee's order. They had they had um, allowed for the law clerk uh, sufficient time to do redactions for privacy purposes. You know, in someone's uh, you know personal phone number, name, uh, th that kind of thing. Uh, but they came with uh, with substantial redactions from the government. So that's that's the first point. Um, the next is that. Uh, while I am the ethics critic, and I was a member of uh, the standing committee that was that was uh, doing this uh, this investigation, uh, all of the committees uh, effectively cease to exist once Parliament is prorogued. So no witnesses can be called, no further documents can be ordered. Um, none of those uh, formal uh, parliamentary uh, um, tools can be taken out of the toolbox. Uh, I hear from a lot of folks that they say, well, there should be a vote of non-confidence because Justin Trudeau has prorogued. Well, we, we, we have no opportunity to do that until the House uh, reconvenes and, uh, and, and then, of course, see what he has on offer. So the short answer to your question is uh, the opposition, um, the, the best tool that we have is a microphone and, uh, and, talking to, uh, and talking to journalists like yourself. When Parliament does resume, can the committee resume its work or is it really going back to start from zero? Yeah, back to zero. So the, the committees will be reconstituted. Uh, all of the members will need to be reappointed to those committees or, or not. Uh, then the motion to uh, initiate hearings or a study and, uh, and, um, and then to write a report and to get the documents and, and to order witnesses. All of those things have to start from, from square one. So if you have this prorogation, which halts this investigation into the government, I mean, how can Canadians have any confidence that there is a, a willingness to have the investigation, to have the hearing of facts from the government, which has always been their, their official line that, oh, yes, we want everyone to look into it and, and have at it. And Justin Trudeau made this big magnanimous stand saying that he was agreeing to uh, appear as a witness. But that really doesn't amount to all that much if the testimony goes into a black hole. Well, that's right. And, and we said it before, and this is very much a uh, prorogation uh, to cover up uh, this scandal. And we have uh, we have the independent uh, officers of parliament who are looking at this. And there are many. You know, this matter has been referred to the, the ethics commissioner, uh, to the procurement ombudsman, to the privacy commissioner, uh, to uh, Elections Canada and to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. I think I'm leaving one out, but there's a lot. So those are all happening. But but members of parliament have a responsibility to be a check against the power of the executive. That's our role as as members, all members of the House who don't sit in government. That's their job. And um, it is very damaging to our democratic institutions when we have uh, a prime minister and a government who um, so blatantly, um, you know, uh, throw transparency uh, to the wayside and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, and flat out. Um, mislead Canadians. They lie to Canadians when they say that, you know, well, they've got all of the, you know, opposition members have all of the information and they can, they can read that and continue to ask us questions. That's what Justin Trudeau said when he prorogued uh, Parliament. So I'm not sure um, what time the Prime Minister is, uh, is prepared to take my questions today or tomorrow um, because, uh, because with the chamber locked, with committee rooms locked, um, that, uh, that check that the opposition is, is to exercise on the government uh, isn't available. You mentioned that a microphone becomes the primary tool in the opposition's toolbox right now. What have the more explosive aspects of these documents revealed? I, I know we heard uh, in some cases from uh, you and, and Mr. Polyev last week about some of the lines from the bureaucrats, but has there really been a, a smoking gun or anything you'd characterize as such in these? Well, I, I think that the contention that this was something that was uh, imagined by or or first initiated by the public service has been proven to be false. So um, we've heard over and over again from ministers and the prime minister and his chief of staff that this was recommended by the nonpartisan professional public service. Right. It was recommended after uh, after. Uh, the WE organization wrote the proposal. So, of course, they were the only one who can deliver on it. The, it, the, the WE organization was the only organization that could deliver on WE's proposal. And, uh, and we know that there, was, uh, there were conversations with officials, with ministers, and this WE organization that were um, uh, denied in, in sworn testimony. And so 
this this idea uh, that this was you know just one morning a public servant woke up said this is going to be a billion dollar contract it's going to go to cabinet it gets um, it gets approved in in a few weeks time it's it's too incredible to believe so um, the 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 problem is is that the ministers uh, the prime minister his chief of staff they've gone to great efforts to muddy the water and what this comes down to Andrew is an organization that gave members of the prime minister's family more than half a million dollars and the government then gave that organization a half a billion dollars in that same government there's a finance minister who accepted more than forty thousand dollars in illegal gifts from this organization so um, that's what this boils down to and that's what um, Canadians need to need to consider when Justin Trudeau talks about doing a reset he's not looking to reset his legislative agenda he's looking to uh, change the channel uh, reset the story from from this tr this huge scandal Another story that came out recently, the husband of Justin Trudeau's chief of staff, uh, Katie Telford, her husband, Rob Silver, had apparently lobbied the finance minister's office for changes to the wage subsidy program. He's not a registered lobbyist. Thankfully, his uh, pursuit of changes was not successful. But there does seem to be the, this culture of nepotism and, you know, a, a wink and a nod to get into uh, some office where someone could give you what you want. Well, that's right. And we and, and when the question was asked if uh, Mr. Silver had contacted uh, finance department officials or the prime minister's office, um, there was no response. And it wasn't until it was revealed that there were these um, previously unreported lobbying interactions by an by a then unregistered uh, lobbyist. Um, it, it's uh, it should cause people great concern uh, that that we have. Um, in the in the in the halls of power, uh, some people have give, been given a hall pass uh, because of who they know, and that's that's the pattern that we've seen with the Trudeau Liberals. They put their um, they put their friends first, and when anyone calls them out, when anyone calls them out, um, they punish them. They punish them as an enemy. We saw that in the criminal prosecution of SNC Lavalin, where the prime minister was found to have interfered, and uh, the then Attorney General um, Jody Wilson-Raybould, um, she. She called it for what it was, and she was fired. Dr. Jane Philpott, then the Treasury Board president, uh, saw what was happening, um, wouldn't be a part of it. She was fired. And we, we we see this time and again. So it's no wonder that it, around the cabinet table, few have the courage to stand up to the prime minister. Um, and that's why uh, the official opposition believes that um, more than a few faces need to change around that table. And as you mentioned, these are precisely the questions and issues that can't be raised right now when there's no question period, no committee, and no parliamentary mechanism. Yep, that's, that's absolutely right. Conservatives called for the House to sit over the summer in a modified fashion to respect public health guidelines, but it's essential that um, the government is held to account. When we have uh, opposition members who, who give their input, who give the feedback from their constituents uh, to the, and, and input that into the process, we get better outcomes for all Canadians. And um, this government certainly has demonstrated that they can't uh, operate without uh, scrutiny. And uh, and it doesn't seem like there's any adults in the room. So it, it is very important that uh, that Parliament reconvene. And um, and, you know, frankly, uh, we should have been in session all summer. Conservative MP Michael Barrett, thank you very much for your time, Michael. Thanks. Have a great day. That was Michael Barrett. Thank you very much again to Michael. And that about does it for me for today. My thanks to all of you for tuning into the program. If you have anything you'd like to share, my email is at Andrew Lawton. No, that's my Twitter. My Twitter is at Andrew Lawton. My email is close, Andrew at AndrewLawton.ca. Look forward to hearing from you. We will be back next week with more of Canada's most irreverent talk show. Thank you, God bless, and good day, Canada. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.